Salguete, Disky Bully. Soy el tutorísimo, tu profesor favorito. Y aquí estamos con la Daisy que hoy tiene papitis para explicaros el tema 3 de cuarto de la ESO de Unit 3 de Conservative Order and the Liberal Revolutions, porque esto es en inglés. Así que ya sabéis, vamos a utilizar la presentación que hemos visto en clase y estos apuntes maravillosos que la Daisy aún no me los ha roto para explicarlo. Así que venga, vamos allá porque esto es un tema largo y nos va a durar... Vamos a pasar mucho tiempo con él. So, in this unit, in the conservative order and the liberal revolutions, we are going to talk about the political development in Europe and in Spain during the 19th century. We are going to talk about first the conservative order, what in Spanish is called la Europa la Restauración, then the unifications of Italy and Germany, and then the Spanish history part, the reigns of Fernando VII and Isabel II, and el sexenio democrático to end with. So let's start with the first one, the conservative order. And first of all, we have to talk about the Congress of Vienna. If you remember, we ended the last unit with the defeat of Napoleon Bonaparte in Waterloo in 1815. So the victors of these wars, of the Napoleonic Wars, Um, Austria, Prussia, Russia and the United Kingdom are going to meet in Vienna in this Congress and this Congress was convened by Clemens von Metternich which is the, uh, or who was the Chancellor of the Austrian Empire. Here they're going to agree, uh, they're going to agree with some territorial changes throughout Europe. There you have. Uh, we are not going to, we don't need to know any every territorial change, but at least you need to know that France went back to its borders of 1790, so prior to the war of the convention. And also they set up, well this is how um, Europe looked like in 1815 after the territorial changes of the Congress of Vienna, uh, but mostly they set up the ideological principles of the so-called conservative order, which were and the uh, legitimacy of the absolute monarchs and the denial of the national sovereignty. sovereignty. This means that uh, they are going to guarantee the political system of the absolute monarchy, the one we studied in the Ancien Regime unit in all of Europe. And also they are going to give back the power to the dynasties that Napoleon had overthrown. For example, in Spain, Fernando VII, the Bourbon, is going to come back. And to guarantee all this new order, this new conservative order, the three main powers, Russia, Austria and Prussia, are going to set up this uh, military alliance, which is called or which is named, uh, known as the Holy Alliance, La Santa Alianza. Later, uh, the United Kingdom and France will join this alliance. There you have, these are the original members. And next, we're going to study the liberal revolutions because this conservative order is not going to be, it's only going to last until 1848 and many, uh, many of the peoples of Europe are going to fight against it. So the principles of liberalism and nationalism are going to be the main oppos opposition forces to this conservative order and there are going to be several revolutions in three waves 1820, 1830 and 1848 and they are going to try to set up new liberal regimes or at least new countries because also this is the time of nationalism. So as I said there are three main revolutionary waves. The first one in the 1820s The, there were in several points of Europe, but mostly and the most important countries are Spain, Naples, Portugal and Greece. It all started with the, the revol uh, pronunciamiento del Correo Riego, del General Riego. We are not going to spend a lot of time here because we're going to study it later, but he managed to uh, force Fernando VII to establish a liberal regime, el Trienio Liberal, And this is going to be destroyed, this new regime, by Los Timirijo de San Luis. It's a French army uh, commanded by, or it was 
ordered by the Holy Alliance to give Fernando VII back his absolute power. In Portugal, they managed to uh, draft a new constitution in 1822. In Naples, also a liberal regime, but they were also they also suffered the intervention of the troops of the Holy Alliance. This time, they were Austrian. And in Greece, it was the nationalist revolt of the 1820s, and they managed to get their independence. They achieved independence from the Ottoman Empire later in 1829. Then, in 1830. The main countries which are going to have revolutions are France, Belgium and Poland. Uh, it all started in France, where Charles X, the little brother of Louis XVIII, who, were, who was the king that came back after the defeat of Napoleon, he was reigning as an absolute monarch, and this, uh, with this uprising, this revolution in Paris, they are going to set up a new monarchy, this time and this is the famous uh, picture, this time with uh, another dynasty, with Louis Philippe the I of Orleans. This is called the Monarchy of July. Mm -hmm. And he reigned say, from now on as a constitutional monarch with a liberal re regime instead of the absolute monarchy of Charles X of Bourbon. Also, the Belgium is going to achieve independence from the Kingdom of the Low Countries because after the Congress of Vienna, all both of these countries, the Netherlands and Belgium, formed a single country, the Kingdom of the Low Countries. But uh, since 1830, they are going to uh, establish a new country, which is Belgium, the actual Belgium. And also Poland is going to try to gain their independence. This is also a nationalist um, revolution, from the, in this case, from the Russian Empire. But they are going to be unsuccessful. Finally, in 1848, there's a, way, a huge wave of uh, mostly nationalist um, uh, revolutions all over Central Europe, and this is called also the Springtime of Nations. And uh, again, the main uh, or the most important country is going to be France, also Austria, in which uh, Metternich had to step down. But in France, the monarchy of Louis Philippe I of Orleans is going to be abolished and they're going to set up the Second Republic after this, uh, this uprising. And the first president uh, is going to be uh, the nephew of uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, which is Louis Napoleon Bonaparte. First, he's going to be the president of the Second French Republic, and but in 1852 he's going to proclaim himself as emperor of the French with the name of Napoleon III of the Second French Empire. Uh, also, in the rest of Europe, we are going to have nationalist uprisings. For example, in Berlin, they are going to look for the unification of all the German peoples. Also in Vienna, in Hungary, they're going to try to, to establish their own Hungarian state. And also in Poland, again, they are, going, they are not going to be successful. And uh, also in the north of Italy. So this is the first part of the unit, the conservative order. Here you have the summary. And as a consequence, we have the emergence of democratic and nationalist ideas. The nationalist ideas or the ideology is this one which aims for every country or not, I mean for every nation or for every people to achieve or to create their own state. They look for a state for every nation or for every people. Finally, the Democrats are the, this radicalization of the liberals in which they are not only going to look for national sovereignty but for popular sovereignty with universal male suffrage and also with extension of some collective rights, not only political rights but also social rights, uh, the rights of assembly, rights of association, freedom of speech, of religion, and etc. etc. And um, during this or within this all these nationalist ideas and uprisings there are going to be one or well, two of them which are very important and they are going to lead to the unifications of italy and germany two countries that exist today and we are going to study the steps first with the italian unification 
So, this is the state of Italy in 1843 before the unification. It is divided in nine different countries. And there is one of these countries is going to be the leader of the unification, the Kingdom of Piedmont, Sardinia or Piamonte Cerdeña. And the leaders are going to be the King, Victor Emmanuel II, and the Prime Minister, mostly this guy, Camilo Benso, he's known as the Count of Cabur or Cabur, uh, simply Cabur. And first they are going to do the following. First they are going to set up an alliance in 1859 with France to fight the Austrians. And because of that and because of the, their victories in Magenta and Solferino, they are going to sign peace and incorporate Lombardy to them, this territory here. They are going to get Lombardy for the Kingdom of Piedmont Sardinia, but in exchange they are going to lose these two regions, the Nice and the Savoy, which are going to be ceded to France in exchange for their support. Later, in 1860, this guy, Giuseppe Garibaldi, a Republican, but also an Italian nationalist, he is going to set up an expedition of volunteers that is going to invade the kingdom of the two Sicilies in the south. His volunteers were known as the Red Serts. You can see them here uh, dressed in Red Serts. And this expedition is known as the Expedition of the Thousand, the Expedizione dei Mille. The, he's going to manage to conquer all the kingdom of the two Sicilies and expel the Bourbons. He later will, this is Garibaldi, Later, he will cede this uh, kingdom to the kingdom of Piedmont Sardinia and at the same time, in the states of Middle Italy, such as Parma, Modena, Florence and part of the Papal States, they are going to set up plebiscites, referendums to join, to vote for joining this new kingdom of Italy and they are going to win. So, by, the, by 1861, we have most of the Italian peninsula except the Papal States and Venice, which is under control of Austria, and without Savoy and Nice, which was given to France, we have the, uh, pro and they, well, uh, actually the Piedmont proclaimed the new kingdom of Italy with Victor Emmanuel II as, his first, as its first king and the capital in Florence. So, uh, after that, um, Italy is going to intervene in the Seven Weeks War. We will see that in the unification of Germany. And because of their victory, the Prussian and Italian victory, Italy is going to get Venice from the Austrians in 1866. So, we only have left the Papal States with Rome, which is going to be conquered in 1870, taking advantage of, of the situation that Rome was not uh, helped by the French because the, the French were fighting the Prussians in the Franco-Prussian War. So the uh, Italian troops are going to enter Rome, annexing the Papal States, and finally by 1871 we have almost all of modern Italy united. And these are the steps. Then we have the German unification. In the unification, uh, starting in 1864, well, we have that these are all these red lines, the German Confederation. This is uh, these circles, the areas in which the German culture, the people with German culture, culture lives. And there are going to be two main countries with German culture, which are Prussia and Austria. And Prussia is going to be the leader of the unification, mostly the King Willem I of Prussia and Prussia with two S's and the, his Chancellor Otto von Bismarck. So what are the steps? First, in the dano prussian War, both Austria and Prussia all together, allied, they were allied, they uh, invaded and conquered these two countries, these, not counties, these two duchies, Slevich and Holstein, from the Danish, and they're going to administer both of them by themselves. But two years later, they're going to fight each other in the Seven Weeks War in 1866. And in the Battle of Sadowa, the Germans defeated the Austrians, so they could unite all of Northern Germany, and this was called the Northern German Confederation. 
And finally, uh, four years later, in 1870, there's going to be a war versus the French versus the Empire of Napoleon III. And Napoleon III, I mean, the Franco-Prussian War, and the uh, Prussians are going to destroy the um, uh, the French in mostly after the Battle of Sedan, in which Napoleon III, Napoleon III, I mean, was captured. So after that, the Prussians are going to enter Paris, and the Second Reich, or the Second German Empire, is going to be proclaimed in Versailles in 1871 with Willem I as Kaiser, which is the German word for emperor. And after that, the last German, um, German states joined the newly formed German uh, Reich and also the French annexed the Alsace and the Lorraine, these orange territories from the, the Prussians annexed this uh, territory from the French and it will remain, they remain the German until the First World War, the First World War. So this is how Europe looked like in 1871. We have the German Empire already formed with Alsace and Lorraine and we also have the Kingdom of Italy united with the great powers, France, which now has is a, is a republic again, the Third Republic, United Kingdom, Austria, Germany and Russia. This is, uh, well, this, and these are Italy and Germany, the personifications of the nations. And this is the summary again. I remember you, I, that you can pause the video or you can watch or you can look at this summary in the presentation, which is in the Aula Virtual Vaya. And now we um, start with the final part of the unit, which is the Spanish part with the reigns of Fernando VII, Isabel II y el sexenio. So first, Fernando VII. As you remember, Fernando VII came back to Spain after the Treaty of Valencay signed in 1813 with Napoleon. He came back the following year in 1814 and he went uh, to Valencia instead of going to Madrid because in Madrid, if you remember, they were uh, there was uh, Cortes and there was the 1812 constitution waiting for him. But he went to Valencia because he knew he had supporters there and he received the support of some 69 absolutist deputies from the Cortes because they handled them this document which is called El Manifiesto de los Persas and you can recognize it because it starts like this Era costumbre los antiguos persas pasar cinco días bla 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 they ask the, the king, Fernando VII, these deputies, to rule as a, an absolute monarch. So, because of this and because of the support that some general gave him of the army, a general Elio, o Elio, Elio, lo que se dice, in 1814, he rejected the constitution of 1812 and ruled as an absolute monarch. And this starts his first period, which is called Ex Exenio Absolutista, starting in 1814, ending in 1820. And this, uh, this period was, in this period, a lot of these liberals were persecuted and most of them organized this, the so-called pronunciamientos. And this is a uh, a type of Spanish uh, military revolt in which some regiments uh, uh, revolted against the monarchy and proclaimed a liberal regime. Most of them were unsuccessful and some of them had to flee to other countries, like uh, in France, like Spocimina or Juan Díaz Porlier, and some others were shot, like Luis de la C. But there was one who was successful, the pronunciamiento de Rafael de Riego en Cabezar de San Juan, Provincia de Sevilla, in 1820, which started a new period in the reign of Fernando VII, known as el Trienio Liberal, uh, that lasted three years until 1823. So this forced, this pronunciamiento forced Fernando VII to sign or to swear the constitution of 1812 and to, and to rule, I mean, as a liberal monarch. They also created the National Militia, militia which is a uh, corps of liberal volunteers to defend the new regime and the constitution. 
But as you remember, they, we have, and as I mentioned before, a daisy, as I mentioned before, and the Holy Alliance intervened in Spain, particularly with a French army called Los Cien Mil Hijos de San Luis, commanded by El Duque de Angulema or the Duke of Angoulême, which in 1823 entered Spain and re-established the absolute monarchy of Fernando VII. So now there is the third period, which is La Década Ominosa, Ominosa means horrible, terrible, bad, and in which uh, Fernando VII again returned to absolutism and also uh, kept, he kept now more harshly, he kept repressing the liberals. In the meantime, the, uh, the country had gone bankrupt and we had the problem of the independence of the American colonies. This also, well, and also more pronunciamientos. Uh, this was the main problem the, because during the independence, Spanish War of Independence, some of these countries started their independence wars and during the, all the reign of Fernando VII we had to fight the Los Libertadores. Uh, and it ended in 1824 with the Battle of Ayacucho where Peru gained their independence. These are most, some of the leaders, Bolívar San Martín. Battle of Ayacucho, blah, 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 blah. We only remain, we only kept, a ver el mapa, Cuba, Puerto Rico, and in Asia, the Philippines. So, at the, in, um, uh, by 1833, Fernando VII is about to die, but it, he only had two daughters, but uh, the law, the Salic law, which is a law that comes from the from the reign of Felipe V, prevented them from reigning because they prevented women to take on the throne. So the, heir, the heir was going to be his little brother, El Infante Don Carlos. But he signed the, the uh, uh, law, which is called the pragmatic, la Pragmática Sanción, no Pragmática Sanción, La Pragmática Sanción, in 1830, that um, rejected the, or repealed the Salic law. So the future Isabel II could reign. And this is going to create a problem during the reign of Isabel II that we are going to see. So, uh, Fernando VII died in 1833 and Isabel II came to power. But in 1833, she is three years old, so there's going to be a regency. And the regency of her mother, which is Maria Cristina de Borbón, Dos Sicilias, the last wife of Fernando VII. But uh, this is the little brother of Fernando VII, el infante Carlos María Isidro. He's not going to accept the la pragmática sanción and he's going to claim the throne for himself. Thus, he's going to start which is called the First Carlist War, la Primera Guerra Carlista, in 1833 and lasted until 1840. Uh, the Carlists were strong in mostly north of Spain, in uh, uh, by Vasco, Catalonia, and El Maestrazgo, and his main military commander was Tuma Tomás de Zumalacarri, but he died early in the uh, city of Bilbao. The liberal uh, commander, which uh, is going to be Espartero, the liberals supported Maria Cristina because she promised them to rule as a constitutional monarch. Uh, in exchange of their support. And Espartero is going to win the war against the Carlists and he's going to sign peace in the, in the so-called Abrazo de Vergara or Convention of Vergara in 1839 with the uh, Carlist General Maroto. The war is going to last one more year because Cabrera uh, still kept, uh, kept his, the resistance in El Maestrazgo. And this is Espartero in Madrid con, uh, with the balls. ¿no? Tiene los huevos más grandes que el caballo Espartero. This is the reason. So, uh, now uh, in, in the political point of view, uh, this is Maria Cristina with Isabel II. Maria Cristina first uh, ruled with the moderates because we have uh, moderates and radicals uh, which are called progressives in the Spanish liberals but the liberals wanted to gain power 
So there was a revolt, the, which is called the Motín de la Granja, eh, la Granja San Ildefonso, in 1836. So Maria Cristina had to give the power to the progressives. And these uh, progressives were led, at least in a political way, by Juan Álvarez Mendizábal, which uh, to, who took uh, several political measures. The most uh, important one was the desamortización. A desamortización is the confiscation of property. In this case, the confiscation of church property and the later selling the, of, of it in public auction, en pública subasta. With this, he managed to put into work some uh, lands where who were not productive, las, uh, las manos muertas, and also he gained money for the public treasury. Remember that during Fernando, the, the end of the reign of Fernando VII, uh, Spain had gone bankrupt. And also he drafted the Constitution of 1830, uh, 1837, which is a progressive constitution, even though it has a census suffrage, but it created El Congreso y El Senado. After that, uh, Maria Cristina tried to give the power to the moderates again, but this led to another progressive revolt. And finally, he sí, had to go to exile, and Espartero, who was the victor of the Carlist War and was very popular, was named regent for the last three years of the minority of Isabel II. Espartero was a progressive. And Espartero took several measures, and the most important one was this free trade agreement with the English that ruined the Spanish industry, mostly located in Catalonia. And uh, they revolted, and Espartero no tuvo la mejor idea de... Well, he had the idea of bombing Barcelona from Montjuic. So this uh, ruined his popularity, and he was overthrown as, as regent in 1843. After that, Isabel II was declared by the Cortes of legal age, mayor de edad, at the age of 13. So she swore the constitution and started acting as the effective queen of Spain. So she started to rule effectively. So this is a timeline of all these periods. Remember, we have an alternance between moderates and progressives. The moderates are the conservatives, the progressives are the radicals, entre comillas. We, also, we have already studied the minority of Isabel II, and now we are going to study the effective reign Isabel II was uh, or she preferred mostly the moderates as you can see here instead of the progressive the unionists are the in the center more or less and the leader of the moderates is going to be ramon maria narvaez while in the progressives we have several leaders mendizabal espartero and later juan prim um, in the 1850s, there's going to be a new uh, political party, La Unión Liberal de O'Donnell, and later we are going to see the Democrats and the Republicans by the time of the sexenio. And these are the ideas of these two uh, uh, groups uh, inside or within the liberal Sp the Spanish liberal movement. So. The first years of the effective reign of Isabel II is, are going to be controlled by the moderates of Narvai, the first 10 years until 1854. And uh, so the moderate party is going to rule and he's going to, they are going to do several things. They are going to substitute the 18, 1837 constitution by the 1814, uh, 1845, I mean, constitution, which is a conservative constitution with the suffrage uh, more restricted and also the civil liberties were limited and he took the Narvaez took several measures he centralized taxes he created the penal code of 18 80, 80, 1848 uh, he's going to set up a public education system with la ley moyano the, he's going to sign the Concordat with the, with the Pope, with Pio Noveno, in 1851, and he's going to create the, La Guardia Civil, el, con el Duque de Ahumada, in 1844, en el 44. Esto es una foto del 56. 
and uh, to protect the to maintain law in the countryside so this government went very authoritarian and also they were very influent in the elections and they, they they cheated on the election so the progressives only could get back to power with a military uprising and this uprising this pronunciamiento is going to be performed in 1854 by general leopoldo o'donnell and it's going to be it's going to take place in Vicálvaro, and that is what it, why it's called la Vicalvarada, los cuarteles de Vicálvaro. they brought the, the progressives back to power and the government was given to Espartero one more time. And Espartero took several uh, progressive uh, measures. He drafted uh, the constitution of 1856, which was not approved. And also there was a new confiscation, a new desamortización this time with the properties of the municipal of the towns. With this is called the desamortización de Madoz, which was the Minister of Public Care, the, issue of public, uh, the, the public treasury. Also, he drafted the General Railway Law, la Ley General de Ferrocarriles, in 1855, which boosted the railway system in Spain. The first uh, uh, trains were, were in Barcelona in 1848, Barcelona Mataró, the second Madrid Aranjuez in 1851. So it expanded, this new law expanded a lot, the law, the railway net, ay Dios mío, Daisy, mira aquí, the railway net in Spain. And uh, after that, after these two years, the government was uh, given to Leopoldo O'Donnell with his newly formed uh, political party, La Unión Liberal, somewhere between the moderates and the progressives. And during his rule, he intervened a lot in, uh, in foreign policy, in the foreign conflicts. For example, he intervened with France in, in Indochina. We also intervened in Morocco and get some lands from them. And we collaborated in the establishment of the Second Mexican Empire with Maximiliano I as an emperor. Salió mal. And also, well, in some other places, in Republica Dominicana, in Chile, etc, etc. But the, the important thing is after that he alternated the government with Narvaez and the government ended at the end of uh, the reign of Isabel II that there was a crisis. And mostly an economic crisis starting in 1866. And in this, uh, this same year, some uh, most of the opposition to the rule of Isabel II, uh, most of the well, they gathered, they met in the Belgian city of Ostende and signed uh, this uh, this so-called Pacto de Ostende, in which they committed to end with the reign of with the regime of Isabel II, and this is this this girl here, and this is going to lead to the sexenio. Absolutista, this is the summary again, which started in 1868. So, in this year, there's going to be an uprising, a pronunciamiento en Cádiz, with, and this is going to lead to the so-called Revolución Gloriosa of 1868. The leaders are going to be mostly Juan Prim, but also Francisco Serrano and Juan Bautista Topete. So, in this uprising in Cádiz, they're going to read this manifiesto, which ends with Viva España con Honra. They wanted a democratic Spain. These are the signers of the ones, the guys who signed El Pacto de Ostende. So, after the military victory in the Battle of El Puente de Alcolea, Provincia de Córdoba, Isabel II had to go to exile and yeah, a provisional government, un gobierno provisional, was established in Spain, led first by el general Prim. Aquí lo tenéis. A ah, Prim, qué grande, Juan Prim. And Isabel II had to go first to Paris, later to, to England, I think. So this is the provisional government of 1869, led by Prim, and also Serrano, Topete, etc., etc. This is the government that established Le Peseta como, bueno, as the, the national currency, and they, uh, they 
call out for election for democratic election with universal male suffrage for the first time in Spanish history and this new Asamblea Constituyente drafted the Constitution of 1869, the first Democrat uh, Constitution of Spain. Here you have the characteristics and the but this uh, this constitution was a uh, or set up a monarchy a constitutional monarchy so they had to look for a new king and the chosen one is going to be Amadeo de Saboya the son of Victor Emmanuel II the one we saw in the unification Iresi, of Italy so Amadeo I is going to be the chosen one mostly by Prim which was the which was his main support in Spain and Amadeo Saboya is going, this is, this is the guy, very handsome, and he's going to embark into Spain and he's going to arrive in 1871. He was elected in 1870, but he came to Spain in 1871. In the meantime, Prim is going to be assassinated in this attack in La Calle del Turco. And Amadeo Saboya, because of this, he's lost one of his main supporters in, in, in Spain. And also, uh, well, Amadeo I was a good king, but he had to fight several problems. This is el pobre de pri, pobre, pobrecico. And he had to uh, he had to fight another Carlist uprising, la tercera guerra carlista. This is Carlos VII. He had to fight also a Cuban insurrection, a Cuban independent insurrection, the so-called La Guerra de los Diez Años, that started in 1878. And also he had to he had to suffer some other terrorist attacks, and after that, he also had to face the opposition of the Republicans and the moderates. And after two years, he was tired. He was not able to uh, to hold all of this, and he abdicated and gave the crown. Mm, cosita gave the crown back to the nation, to the Cortes. This is the text where he abdicated. So the Cortes met together, Congreso and Senado, and they proclaimed the first Spanish Republic, la primera república española. This was a very unstable regime because he had to face all this opposition we have named, we have pointed out in... A ver, Daisy, in... Um, ay, cosita. Uh, during the reign of Amadeo I Saboya, a ver que me lío. But also, uh, it was uh, there were several. Uh, well, these are these are pictures of the proclamation of the republic, and this is the Spanish republic, the symbols. But also, see, uh, they had to face additional problems. Uh, for example, well, first they wanted to set up a federal republic because, and these were the federal states with a constitution that was not approved of 1873. There was a dispute between the centralist uh, or the, the unitary and the federal republics, and this led to several governments one after another. The four presidents of the first republic, we have to know their names, were the following in this order. Figueras, Pi Margal, Salmerón, and Castellar. It had four of them during 11 months. And as I said, the problems was the division, or were the divisions between the Unitarios y Federales, the Unitarian Federal Republicans. Also, the, the deal they had to deal, the government had to deal with the Cuban insurrection and the Third Castellist War, as well as Amadeo I de Saboya. But also, addition, in addition to this, there was and what, what they call the so-called rebellion, rebellion cantonal or cantonal rebellion, in which several uh, cities proclaimed themselves as independent cantons in order to later federate or create a federation uh, within the uh, Spanish Federal Republic. And they had to fight them. The most important one was El Cartón de, Canta de Cartagena, which, wepa, which, uh, well, this, this is the, um, the most famous, ay, ay, está llena de mierda. The most famous episode in which the rebels took over the Castillo de Galera de Cartagena and they showed a red flag, a Turkish flag, because there was no red flag. Finally, the Republic also had to fight the monarchies, the supporters, Alfonsinos, the supporter of uh, the future Alfonso XII, the son 
of Isabel II, which was studied in, in, in England. So this republic, this federal republic or democratic republic, ended with a military coup, el golpe del general Pavia, in January 1874. His troops entered the Congress and they established, uh, they kept formally the republic by establishing a dictatorship of General Serrano, which is here. He ruled as a dictator, was as by decrees all the year of 1874 until uh, December 29th, in which uh, there was a pronunciamiento en Sagunto del general Arsenio Martínez Campos. He proclaimed, the, he brought back the monarchy and proclaimed Alfonso XII, the son of Isabel II, as king. So, uh, and Alfonso XII came back in 1875, so there is a new period in the hist Spanish history called La Restauración Borbónica that we will study in another unit. So this is a summary of the sexenio. Isabel II, La Gloriosa, Con Viva España con Honra, Prim Serrano Topete, La Batalla de Alcolea. Eh, esto es la regencia de, de Serrano cuando están esperando a Amadeo de Saboya, viene Amadeo de Saboya, que dura hasta el 73, hay cuatro presidentes de la república, eh, Figueras, Pimargal, Salmerón y Castelar, posteriormente el golpe de Pavía y de Sagunto que vuelve a establecer la monarquía en la persona esta vez de Alfonso XII. So, this is the summary again, and this is the mummy of Prim, which leads us to an end. Qué guapo era, me cago en la leche. And this is it. Aquí tenéis a Daisy, no hace más que darme por saco. Mírala, aquí sí. Aquí sí. Bueno, pues esto ha sido todo. Si tenéis alguna duda me la podéis dejar en comentarios o contactarme por las, eh, los canales habituales. Muchas gracias por verlo y nos vemos en el próximo. Adiós.